Encoding Decoding by our pal Stuart Hall. What I'm going to try to do is explain it as simply as I possibly can. All right. Basically, what encoding and decoding is, is it's a model of communication. And you can tell because there's a picture that illustrates it. So what kind of model of communication is this? Stuart Hall was a big believer in the audience. So at the time, even though models like the hypodermic needle theory had fallen out of favor, Hall believed that there was still some lingering behaviorism and positivism that was still within the study of media and communication. Stuart Hall hated that. He believed in the audience and he created this model of communication in part as a critique of that lingering influence that behaviorism had. So what exactly is this model of communication and how does it work? So according to Hall, the process of communication is the process of meaning and messages being organized through codes. In this process of organizing messages through codes, there are two determinant moments or moments where the underlying meaning is determined. So those two moments are encoding and decoding. At these moments, the meaning embedded in a message is in discursive form. In other words, it's being constructed within a discourse. So what is this discourse? Well, Stuart Hall made it very clear. He drew us a picture. In the process of encoding, there are frameworks of knowledge, relations of production, and technical infrastructure that comprise the discourse within which a particular message is encoded. And on the other hand, in decoding, the decoded message is also constructed within a discourse. So that discourse similarly is made up of frameworks of knowledge, relations of production, and technical infrastructure. What's the difference? Well, on the side of encoding, who is the encoder? The encoder is the broadcaster. The encoder is the media company, the content creator. On the side of decoding, the decoder is the audience, the viewer, the reader, the consumer. So these two entities have totally different discourses going about them, even though they're both made up of frameworks of knowledge, relations of production, technical infrastructure. The nature of these things is totally different. Essentially, what Hall is getting at here is that the meaning is constructed within a discourse at both ends of the process, but the discourse may not be the same discourse on both ends. So, for example, in television, when creating a program, the creators of the program want to send across a certain message, but there are certain things they have to work around when creating this message, and that's the discourse. So, for example, relations of production. The production has to make money. The money will come from advertisers. We cannot displease the advertisers, right? Another one is technical infrastructure. The easiest example here would be sets. So let's say in a drama, you're planning to shoot a wedding episode, but you don't have access to a church set. Then you can't shoot that episode right away. You need to find a way to write around that. And that affects the message that you're going to convey. What is the discourse like on the other hand? So for the viewers, they have, for example, frameworks of knowledge. They have seen other TV programs. They can compare the program that comes out to those programs. They have knowledge of genre. They have relations of production. They have friends that they can discuss the program with. They have access to the internet where they can see reviews of the program, which will most certainly affect the way that they interpret what they're watching. So that's just one example, you know, within TV, but it can also be applied within other forms of media and even outside the media in the way that we communicate with other people every day. You know, as someone who communicates every day, you might be thinking, when I talk to other people, this is not something that I consider. I don't think about my discourse or the other person's discourse or how we are both encoding and decoding each other's messages. How does this happen every day? It happens in any form of communication. It's just that some codes, in this case, you know, the basics of written and oral communication are so widespread and they're taught at such an early age within a particular society or a particular culture that they appear natural. The process is still encoding and decoding, but it doesn't feel like that. 
The meaning is so easy to decode, it doesn't even feel like you're decoding it. So there's no point in which communication breaks down. There's no point where one side misinterprets the other. The codes used on both sides are just so easily understood that communication goes very smoothly, very naturally. So that's how it goes down for simple everyday conversations and communication such as that. But how does it work for more complicated forms of communication when what's being communicated can be interpreted in many different ways or when it can have multiple different meanings? There is this notion in communication that there is a connotation and a denotation. And the denotation is the literal meaning and the connotation is like the sort of metaphorical, uh, more associative collection of meanings that you associate with a certain sign. So Hall wants to argue that the distinction between connotation and denotation is merely an analytic one. It's not a real thing. It just helps us analyze communication better. Why does he say that? He says that because in reality, nothing is ever just surface level. Nothing ever only signifies the literal. There's always an associative meaning. There's always a connotation. However, by making this distinction between connotation and denotation, we will know within a society, within a culture, what is generally accepted as literal. Hall defines exactly what is a connotative level or the point wherein a sign stops being surface level, it starts being deep, and starts getting ideological. Classic example here in literary analysis is when an author writes, the curtains are blue. At the denotative level, that simply means the curtains are blue. But digging deeper into the connotations, the metaphorical meanings there, perhaps this means the character that stays in the room is always sad. And you can connect this to the greater structure of like, let's say, mental health and depression. And at that stage, at the stage where it's connotation, it becomes ideological. That's something that's impossible when we're talking about the denotation or the literal and obvious meaning of things. So given that, by nature, connotation can have multiple meanings. But what's stopping anyone from just saying, oh, I understood it this way, that's correct. And I'll go back to the example of the blue curtains here. In all likelihood, the author just meant to say that the curtains were blue. We're adding meaning here where there is none. How do we prevent people from doing that? How do we discredit decoded meanings that seem baseless? Is there a base at all? Paul says that there is a basis and that society creates this. The dominant cultural order. A connotation can have multiple meanings, but not all meanings are of equal value in a society because societies impose this dominant cultural order. In other words, they impose a map of preferred meanings or preferred readings. So some things are just very easily discarded because they don't fit within the preferred meanings of a society. If you're familiar with video games and competitive esports, this map of preferred meanings is sort of like the metagame of a society or a culture. Going back to broadcasting, there are times when the audience does not operate within the same code that the broadcaster operates in. Audiences operate without the so-called preferred code, and this creates systematically distorted communication. It's not failure of communication. Stuart Hall says this is systematically distorted communication, and that's where the critique of behaviorism comes in, because the earlier theories of behaviorism say, if audiences don't get the point, that's a fail. That's an epic fail. Communication has failed because they don't get the point. And it's here that we go back to this idea that the discourse in which the encoder operates in may be different from the discourse that the decoder operates in. And therefore, it creates distortion. After all, through things like the dominant cultural order, the encoding process can limit the decoding process, but it cannot prescribe a certain way to decode the message. And with that, Hall presents three different ways that audience can possibly decode an encoded message. I like to think of them as lawful, neutral, and chaotic. 
The first is what I label the lawful code or the dominant hegemonic code. In this decoding position, the audience decodes the message in the exact same way the producers encode it, this so-called professional code. There is sort of a perfectly transparent communication similar to with natural codes, but the elites and the producers may use this to push a certain agenda or to push a certain ideology and keep it in hegemony. Hence the name dominant hegemonic code. The next position, which I dub the neutral position, is negotiated code. And it's neutral in the sense that it acknowledges the hegemony, but it creates its own ground rules, its own exceptions to the rule to better fit personal circumstances and local conditions. So for example, in the university, we have a sort of hegemonic system of grading where you know you have uno, which is the highest grade, you have cinco, which is the lowest, and you have a bunch of other permutations in between. But in light of COVID-19, we might want to adjust that. Some professors will do pass-fail. Some professors will do mass promotion. And those are exceptions to the rule that they make because of a special circumstance, in this case, the pandemic. So the last code, which is oppositional code, is the one that I call the chaotic code because it very much is chaotic. It throws everything out the window. Audiences using the oppositional code may understand the intended meaning, either fully or to a certain extent, but regardless of that, they choose to reject it and decode the message instead in a quote-unquote globally contrary way or through an alternative frame. A good example here would be the apologists of Ferdinand Marcos in the Philippines because even though they're presented with historical evidence and objective facts, they choose to reject all of those which are telling them that Marcos was a dictator and a human rights violator and instead use an alternative frame that he was a hero and that he contributed a lot to the country. So to end this, I'd like to leave you with a quote to ponder on from the man himself, Stuart Hall. He says, One of the most significant political moments is the point when events which are normally signified and decoded in a negotiated way begin to be given an oppositional reading. Thank you very much for listening and see you around.